last but not least, uh, the indomitable Dr. Robert Rinsby. Is that a right word to describe you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Professor, author, and past president of the National Women's Studies Association, the uh, Social Justice Institute at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and also co-founder of Scholars for Social Justice. And just one note I want to make about Barbara, there's so many things to say about her, the good things to say about her. <laughs> <laughs> but what you did at the, at the National Women's Studies Association for us in the past two years and crafting this space is phenomenal. Yes. And what we're doing today, what you did at NWSA, is really reflective of what you've done throughout your work and you do it every day in Chicago. So you all, none of you are new to this. this kind of space. I'm not gonna get all emotional yet, but to, to go back to the specific question that you all are gonna uh, intro us with for about five minutes each, and I will time you, because yes. uh, I've, I've worked with each of you, <laughs> so that little familiarity, um, is what is the role of black feminism and black queer feminism, or any feminism that you identify with, in framing and shaping black politics and black movements today? And we're going to start with uh, Dr. Richie. OK, Dr. Richie, then we're going to continue uh, with uh, Dr. Sheftal, and then uh, Dr. Ramsby. OK. Um, well, thank you all around. Um, and I don't mean that to say it shortly, but I only have five minutes and she just put the timer on. Um, so I do identify Charlene as a black, queer, feminist, abolitionist. Mm -hmm. That's not unimportant. My work is at the intersection of gender motivated violence and the problem of mass criminalization. The violence work that I do spans um, physical danger, sexual assault, harassment, uh, those things that are typically um, thought of when you think about power abuse in intimate relationships, um, heterosexual relationships, queer families, intergenerational families. Uh, I try to draw out from the intimate sphere to talk about neighborhood and community level violence Park schools, community-based services, and important, I think, for our discussion, grassroots political organizations that sometimes are sites of danger. And then to think about the social and systemic dimensions of gender-motivated violence, um, including uh, police excessive use of force, degrading images in the media, um, presidents who target elected women of color, um, and the erasure of gender-motivated violence in national discussions about violence that are kind of sweeping our, our discourse. Uh, of course, the impact of that violence is not, uh, it accumulates in very particular ways on those people who live in spaces of organized abandonment, women, black people, queer people, people with economic, uh, without economic resources, you get, you get the picture, people with less power in their households, in their neighborhoods, and in the social sphere. I try to draw out that work on violence to make connections between that and the problem of mass criminalization by using the notion of a prison nation. Um, a prison nation is a place where we have seven million people under the control of the criminal legal system in jails and prisons, highest incarceration rate um, in the world, people on parole, uh, wearing ankle bracelets, in secure treatment facilities, etc. Those seven million people who are uh, actually under the control of the criminal legal system are only part of the picture, and I wanna make sure we get back to this when we talk about closing jails and prisons, because they often then become under a different kind of surveillance once they're back in their communities and those ankle bracelets that they're wearing are um, destroying their very skin, right? So they're out of cages, but in um, other places of serious harm. Those, um, I also want to raise up questions of metaphorical prison nation, the way our educational system, our social service system, our child welfare system have become places where people's attempts to survive are criminalized. Um, we have new jobs called welfare fraud officers. We have uh, jail cells in principal's, office, in principal's offices. Uh, we have places where people, even who aren't uh, who haven't yet committed a crime or under the surveillance of the mean-spirited criminal justice or criminal legal system. Those are those same spaces where people experience a very pernicious, profound, underrecognized 
um, dimension of gender motivated violence. So my work tries to bring those two places um, of confinement uh, into discussion with each other. So I want to raise four points that I think uh, bring that to our discussion about what we need to do in the political arena at this moment. One is to think about harsh legal policies of military policing in general. Uh, I want us to think about whose names we have called at this conference mm -hmm. um, and raise questions about, for example, what it means to be a progressive DA better than a non-progressive DA, but that's still a question about a system, right, mm -hmm. that is invested in criminalization and in not responding to gender-motivated violence. I want to talk about overly simplistic analyses of and responses to mass shootings. Those are gendered experiences. There's often gender-motivated violence behind mass shootings. Um, we don't talk about that. Uh, I want to raise up the question of carceral feminist approaches to uh, issues of Me Too um, and Title IX and a whole other set of uh, reform policies. And fourth, one, two, three, four, fourth, um, I've been reflecting on the leadership um, both at this conference uh, and in grassroots mobilizations of uh, women, of black women, of gender non-conforming people, and where does a black queer feminist agenda uh, fit into a black left agenda, which we've been talking about a lot, and where is abolition on the platform? Mm -hmm. So what are we working for? I want to say we're working for abolition. Uh, what, how are we defining that? Not just reform, but really transforming our communities into places where gender-based or gender-motivated violence is understood and taken seriously, and we're not just trying to reform the criminal legal system, but in fact, we're trying to say we need to rebuild our communities, and doing that in a radical way, where we're redistributing life chances, where we're uh, making incremental steps, but also holding communities accountable. Um, those same communities that we, I think, have talked about as if they're um, safe and perfect places, or at least safe places, maybe not perfect places, how do we engage with a transformative justice agenda in mobilization, organizing, building, sol building solidarity movements, etc. So I want to insert questions about uh, true abolition, not just reform, and uh, serious feminist queer attention to issues of gender motivated violence. Thank you. If you're on Twitter or uh, Facebook, you can follow Scholars for Social Justice or Kathy Cohen's account to uh, live tweet, share information about this gathering on social media. Okay, I'm uh, Beverly Gashefno, and we were asked to sort of introduce ourselves, and I want to focus since I, my time is short on my day job, uh, <laughs> which is a uh, scholar college I've been for 48 years. Having been impacted by the civil rights movement, particularly the student movement in the 60s, and having grown up in these three places, Memphis, Atlanta, and Montgomery, which had a huge impact on me. I returned to Spelman in 1971 after having graduated from there in 1966. I did not have a PhD. Um, I, did, I was young. I was untenured. I wasn't even on tenure track. But this is, I was not thinking about a career, I was not thinking about tenure. This is what I wanted to do, and I was very serious about this. I wanted to craft, in a very traditional HBCU, a radical, unapologetic, black feminist space. Even though I was very marginal and was taking a big risk. Um, for me, that would have been in my classrooms, where I wanted to um, have a comparative women's studies program at an HBCU, which we finally had and were the only ones. And I wanted to do institutional transformation and therefore founded something called the Women's Research and Resource Center in 1981. It was really important for us to collaborate in other words, we knew we couldn't just do this work on Spelman's campus, was to, co was to collaborate with other organizations off campus, 
feminists, non-feminists, anti-feminists, across race and class, and global uh, organizations. One of the first organizations that we collaborated with, which was extremely important, was the National Doctors Health Project, mm -hmm. which had its uh, first national conference on the Spelman campus in 1983. And that was actually the place where I learned at a deep level how pervasive and unhealthy and um, difficult to talk about was the issue of gender-specific sexual violence against black women and girls within our communities. I have been teaching um, as an English professor uh, the work of black women writers, and I want to think about, for example, Coca-Cola and Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot about Pecola uh, since uh, Tony passed. So I've been teaching about uh, sexual violence as an English professor, doing you know close reading, the kinds of things that literary people do, but I had actually never been in the room um, and interacting with black women and girls who could speak specifically about their experiences, mainly with family members and friends. I'm talking about incest, which as you know, um, helped to demonize Alice Walker when she dealt with that issue in, 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 in The Color Purple, which we sort of, sort of forget about. So, so that's my early uh, involvement with issues of gender-specific uh, sexual violence within uh, the black community. I want to, I, I, I wrote a little statement so that I wouldn't get um, too much um, off track, and I just want to, I want to just, I want to read it because I feel very strongly about this. Sexual gender specific violence against black women and girls is one of the most painful, controversial, complex, divisive, under addressed, intra-racial community issues. It threatens our well-being in very many different ways. And later on, I wanna, we want to mention what some of those are. It is an old issue. Sexual victimization of black women has historically, as you know, goes back to the transatlantic slave trade. But it is an issue that has never reached high priority status, except perhaps among black feminists. It has never been an issue that we talk about uh, for any length of time when we think about racial justice. And I think about uh, Rosa Parks, who in 1944 um, talked about Risa Taylor. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and for Rosa Parks, anti-rape activism was part of her vision of, of racial justice, but we didn't know about Rosa Parks' work, anti-rape activism, until Danielle uh, McGuire wrote that book at the dark end of the street. And so, 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 so one of the questions that I want to say to us is, why is it that we still, however many years later, do not think about uh, the gender-specific violence that black women and girls experience as one of the ways that we imagine racial justice? Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would also say, why is it that black feminist politics Black feminist queer politics is still not central to the ways in which we imagine racial justice. And I want to just end by saying some of the most important, controversial, and rewarding work that I'm now doing at the Women's Center is LGBTQ advocacy and research at HBCUs. And I can just tell you um, what an uphill battle that is, <laughs> but it is an extremely important work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to listen to comrades. Thank you. I appreciate it. So we've been talking up and down about uh, about elections because, as Kathy just noted and other people know it, politics is bigger than just what happens in the voting booth and with the electors, all that stuff. We talked about campaigns to close jails. Uh, progressive DAs have come up. I actually don't believe that a progressive DA is a real thing. I don't believe that. Uh, but we can talk about that later, or maybe y'all could discuss that. Maybe you can say something about that. Um, I also like to 
introduce the criminalization of pregnancy and what role do district attorneys and state attorneys have in decriminalization of pregnancy uh, for women and other people who are trying to be pregnant or are pregnant. HBCUs, education system, all those things have come up in, the, in conversations today. So what is, what do we need to, oh, oh my God, I'm just talking. Okay, okay. Okay, great, okay. Oh, Lord. All right, you sit right next to me. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, y'all, she has a whole thing laid out. I'm trying to talk Okay, now I just made my whole spiel. And it's not even Okay, anyway. So, um, after you go, Barbara. Uh, <laughs> after you go, Barbara. This, what is the black feminist analysis of That's these things? Where That's where you go with yeah. see? We did it on purpose. All right, I'll try to I'll try to be brief. Um, so you know we've had a whole program uh, talking about racial justice, and the F word really didn't come up, right? Although it was here all the time, um, and it ran through all of the panels, and it is in the practice and the thinking of at least thirteen of the fifteen people that you've heard. Uh, the last day and a half, but I think it's also an example of the ways in which black, particularly black feminists, women of color feminists, I'm talking particularly about black feminism, in terms of its ideas, its practice, its labor, is often invisibilized uh, in our movement. So I just, my last book was on movement for black lives, and part of what I argue is that that was a black feminist-led movement. Uh, around police violence, around state violence, the leadership style, the ideas that were brought to the fore, the holistic analysis that we don't throw anybody under the bus because it's you know because we can't organize a single issue as uh, Audrey Lloyd reminded us because we don't uh, live single issue lives. All of that was present in that struggle at the center of it, right? But often it doesn't get named as such. <clears throat> um, Movement for Black Lives. The majority just had a a 500 person webinar about the uh, current political struggle in Puerto Rico, which is a hell of a struggle. One of the key groups on the streets leading those uh, demonstrations, you know, taking uh, uh, hits from the cops and everything else is uh, Feminista Colectiva Construcción, Vanessa Contreras and others, and they were on the webinar and they are acknowledged by, you know, the, the older generation as really bringing a certain critical edge to that struggle. So, so feminist praxis is not you know, at the tail end. Um, and I would argue too that you know, it's not just, it's, it is of course sexual, you know, struggle around sexual violence. It is the struggle to abolish prisons. It's all these things. But the holistic analysis is one that ultimately has to also indict uh, racial capitalism and empire. And I think uh, uh, hetero patriarchy is a part of that. So I, I've been thinking more and more about the term black left feminism. I used to say, well, that's redundant, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure uh, anymore. I think we, we, we maybe need to, um, need, need to name it. Kathy started us off with um, a quote by Toni Morrison. I think, of course, she's been on our minds. And, and one quote uh, that I pulled of hers, which I think is really what uh, black feminist, black left feminism attempts to answer, is um, in Beloved, she writes, freeing yourselves was one thing. Claiming ownership of that freed self was another. And I think that's our dilemma of we know what we're fighting against, but sometimes we're not all on the same page about what we're fighting for. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to increasingly get on that page. Mm -hmm. The last uh, panel was extremely rich around electoral work and the complicated nature of electoral work, the layered nature of electoral work. And I think we have to, I think the state is a terrain of struggle and we do have to fight for, as most said, state power. But we also have to create alternatives to the, the current state as it exists, mm -hmm. right? We have to imagine other ways of being. I was so happy to meet uh, Mia Evans from the uh, Ujima um, Project in Boston talking about co uh, cooperatives and talking about solidarity economies and really imagining a different set of social relationships. That comes out of a holistic, uh, black left feminist um, challenge to <clears throat> um, to what sometimes people talk about as identity politics. For us, it's not identity politics. It's not around identity. It's around survival, which is not around being divisive. It's not around fragmentation. It's around a holistic analysis, um, bringing our whole selves into the work. Um, so what else do I want to say here? Um, yeah, uh, the other aspect of the work I think is really visionary. You know, when, when Beth or Angela Davis or Gilmore talk about a world without prison, 
they're really echoing the James Baldwin challenge to demand the impossible. And I think we have to do that both in our practical everyday work and in our what has to be simultaneous work of dreaming uh, uh, of a better world and, and fighting to make that world um, real. This moment that we're in is, I think, right um, in a number of ways. There's enormous potential and there's enormous peril, right? It could go any number of di uh, directions. And I think if we don't take it seriously on all fronts, um, that we really both are missing an opportunity but also putting ourselves in a more dangerous situation. I wanted to, if I have a minute or two, you know, just to have one, two, um, uh, I wanted to talk about what does a black feminist praxis look like on the local level. And it's appropriate that I'm sitting next to Charlene because Charlene has been at the center uh, of that work in Chicago for a number of, uh, a number of years. Um, we had a range of, of organizations in Chicago, Movement for Black Lives Chicago, uh, BYP 100, Asada's Daughters, the Let Us Read Collective, wow. all of Love and Protect, all those organizations led by young black feminists doing work around issues of state violence from the Laquan McDonald case, and in that case, adding on the case of Rukia uh, Boyd, 22 year old a black woman who was killed, so not allowing Laquan McDonald to be the only you know, symbol uh, of that struggle. In that struggle also, which really shaped the current, um, you know, the most recent mayoral race, uh, there was a, the ouster of Anita Alvarez, the reactionary uh, state's attorney in Chicago, but it wasn't around celebrating uh, an alternative. It wasn't around becoming a kind of um, knee-jerk cheerleader for the next best thing. It was around saying, we've set a bar and this is not tolerable and you have to go and they did it with all kinds of um, militant, creative, wonderful, direct actions that were, uh, that were very, um, very powerful. I mentioned the, the mayor's race because I think the mayor's race in Chicago, which got a lot of national attention, pointed to what Mo and others have talked about uh, earlier, which you know, was a kind of a limits of representational politics. And I think that is the lesson of this uh, post-Obama moment, that a black president is not enough, a black queer, uh, mayor of Chicago is not enough. It, but in fact, the movement forced that black queer mayor, who wasn't all that progressive, to talk a progressive line, to uh, run a campaign and make promises around progressive uh, issues, as did her opponent, two black women in the runoff, as, as you know. Um, but the movement shaped that discourse and now have created conditions for a um, post-mayoral um, um, uh, struggle that, that that we are sort of deep in. So I think that you know when we when we talk about some of these ideas, they found they seem very um, abstract. But there are ways all over this country, and I see this in Boomer for Black Lives chapters, BYP chapters, uh, BYP 100 chapters, uh, etc. What does this look like in motion? What does it look like in praxis? What does it look like on the ground? And I think that's what we have to ask, both at the local level, but also. Um, at the national level as we construct an agenda for 2020 and beyond. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> so I want to go back to that litany that I shared <laughs> before. Uh, we talked extensively about elections in this conversation, and, and Beth, you really leaned into the, all the things that haven't been discussed extensively. So I'd love to hear from you all um, that not, I don't see it as an extra layer. I actually see it as like foundational mm -hmm. uh, black feminist uh, telling mm -hmm. or understanding and even perhaps vision mm -hmm. on these these different issues, campaigns to close jail. You can pick any or all progressive DAs, HBCUs, and education. I will, um, and also to say, I appreciate all that was talked about. Mm -hmm. So that's important, right? Um, one of the things that occurred to me when someone asked earlier uh, what we can do, it seems to me that we one of the things we can do is learn that black feminist praxis is a thing. It's a, it's a skill. Um, there's it's a theoretical orientation, but it's also a praxis, right? And so. Every organization that we work in, that we create, that we critique, has to have some understanding about the vulnerability of people in that organization to gender-based violence. And I think we have been slow in some uh, black freedom organizations to recognize that despite who's in leadership, mm -hmm. we, it is not always safe for black 
women, for trans people, for right, so that leadership is not equal to safety. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second thing is that, and I really appreciate, Charlene, what you said about intersectionality is complicated, but black feminism would teach us that oppression has multiple forms and occurs uh, simultaneously over and over again and, and is enacted on the same bodies uh, over time. And so we need to know what that looks like. And it is not enough, I think, to just sort of line up in a silo way the different forms of oppression that we're, um, that, that are part of our platform in responding, but to see how they overlap and complicate and deepen the experiences for those who are most vulnerable. Um, and then take leadership from the people who are most vulnerable. So black feminism has a praxis. It's not, um, you know, so it's not, you know, it's not mechanics to it, but there are things that we can do to make our organizations accountable to what black feminist theory has said. And in some ways, we need to go back to school. I mean, we have uh, people who've written about what black feminism looks like. Read Kandahi again, right? Go back and read some of the early black feminist writing. All of us, and I'm not talking, this isn't a generational thing, all of us need to understand what that would look like. And if I could just say one last thing about this, the thing that worries me most are the ways that we rely on a carceral solution to a problem of freedom. And I think that's the subtitle of this discussion around Me Too. Um, and that's a longer discussion. We don't have to have it now. But I do think we need to uh, get clear on what a carceral or punishment-oriented state-sponsored uh, response to problems of injustice looks like and how sometimes in creating a response that relies on carcerality, we're only furthering the problem of the violence in the first place. And I think Me Too is in some ways the perfect example of that. Beth, before you pass it uh, to Beverly, can you just briefly, when you say carcerality, what do you mean? Um, in my work, uh, the critique of carceral feminism is the critique of the work that says when you experience uh, gender violence in the intimate sphere, what you should do is call the police because the police will somehow provide safety for you. And then we create policy around mandatory arrests, the police have to arrest, and we create longer sentences, and we develop domestic violence courts, and we create solutions once people are released from prison that have them always accountable to the state, like the sex offender registry. So we build up the apparatus of the carceral state, the punishment industry, in an attempt to protect people who are vulnerable to violence. When you're in danger, you need to do whatever you need to do to be safe. So I'm not suggesting this as a sort of individual critique of people who turn to uh, law enforcement when they are in harm's way. But more, why have we only said that mandatory arrest, not mandatory housing, about a mandatory job, mandatory health care, mandatory child care so you can go and get some counseling, mandatory, everybody go around and surround him and say stop doing that to her, in the case of her, right? So we have so limited our imagination about how we will respond to the problem of gender-based violence by only relying on the carceral state, which guess what, is one of the most violent perpetrators of um, abuse that we know, right? So that's what I mean by carceral. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just mention very briefly an example of, of what of, of Beth just indicated, that is, what does black feminist practice look like on the ground? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking about the uh, police brutality issue against black men, which I would say is at the top of how it is that we think about racial justice. Mm -hmm. We actually had to have a black feminist movement uh, called Say Her Name, mm -hmm. which basically African American Policy Forum and other organizations they were mounted and be like, yes. But we actually had to have a black feminist movement to say that police brutality is also something that we experience. And very rarely, and I know this before this panel, very rarely are black women's names called been victims of police brutality. And I'll just give you one example on our campus, which was very depressing. Our students, uh, you know, joining the 
uh, you know, movement against police brutality, put up a, a nice um, uh, visual up on Spellman's canvas, and our radical feminist uh, comrades inserted some women mm. in the um, in the visual. And the students who had put up the original one reported our progressive students for vandalism. And uh, so the solution was, OK, uh, let them keep the women there. And the students who put up the all-male one decided instead to take it down, take the whole thing down. And, and in my women's studies class, I had a very interesting conversation about, uh, because I had both sets of students in my class. Mm. And 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 the, the all male ones defended their position, and the other ones didn't. And we had a long conversation about what it means to have a black feminist intersectional um, point of view that would have made it impossible to do that. And certainly, if your comrades <laughs> called it to your attention that there are only men there, you would say, "What? Okay, leave your women up there." So that's that's a, a very small example. Of, of black feminist practice that, that ended up being very divisive mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the class. And of course, uh, it's very familiar, we think about Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. I mean, this is an old issue. It is very difficult to infuse a black feminist politics frequently in, in, in even all black, and in this case, all black women's spaces. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, we just need to keep struggling. Why do you think it's difficult? What are some of the, the things? I, I think that the black community still imagines racial justice to be about a, a, a doing what black men need. I, I, I mean, I think it's not even really that complicated. That, 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 that black men's lives and what has been done to black men under white supremacy is the most important thing. And that black women can you know, we, we can handle it, we, we're strong. I mean, I, I'll give you, I mean, one really painful example. I was in a group and we were talking about this and one of the progressive black women said, black women may have been raped, but they weren't killed. But black men were killed. First of all, that's not even true. But this, and, and you know, Tony, there's a, there's, I wish I could remember it. There's a quote in one of Tony Morrison's novels that captures this. I think that we really do believe because we're in a heteropatriarchal culture, that racial justice means making sure that black men who have been, you know, lynched, though we have, murdered, or uh, emasculated, are the people in our community that we need to first of all attend to. And I think that when you say that, uh, even in, in black women's spaces, it causes tremors. <laughs> I mean, actual tremors. And I'm thinking about. But Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas of, of, of Saga, that was one of the most difficult, I don't know if you remember, that was one of the most difficult political moments for African American feminists uh, in, in, in our history. And, and there were women whose names I won't call, who supported Clarence Thomas. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, I mean, it, it's just unbelievable that, that, that we were supporting uh, uh, not having Clarence Thomas until Anita Hill surfaced. Oh, right. And when Anita Hill surfaced, we uh, closed rank and, and rallied behind Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. And we must have amnesia, because when you say that, people say, oh, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that it's something that we still need to acknowledge. Thank well, you. We, we rallied around R. Kelly too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what? We did. Well, but I think we. I mean, not not you and I, the three of us, four of us, and people <laughs> here. But it is important. There was there was not a, people did, and people that I know did, and since I know some people you know, did and felt and said that there was the you know why are we coming down so hard on R. Kelly when we've got all these other examples of people who mm -hmm. were, you know, so. Thank you for that. One of the things that I, I think rightfully came up a lot in our, our conversations uh, throughout this gathering is the question and the issue of governance. And so Barbara, I wanna go to you next and talk a, a bit about some of the work you've done uh, in creating independent black political spaces 
and uh, I think these were also um, efforts towards governance, uh, perhaps, maybe, or even exploring those questions, and what were some of the things that perhaps got in the way of that? Uh, what are some lessons to be learned? Uh, you as a black feminist, and also you as someone, I think, who is increasingly interrogating and engaging in electoral politics in, in many ways. Yes, with, with some hesitation and mm -hmm. ambivalence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, we use the term independent black political, so I, I don't really think there is any fully independent black political spaces, mm -hmm. and there are some all black political spaces that are frankly reactionary and I don't want to be in them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the black is not the only variable, independent is often not the real thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but I have done a lot of work in uh, black organizations, the black left organizations, um, and trying to bring a feminist um, sensibility to that work, African American Women in Defense of Ourselves, which came out of the, it was a response to um, the Clarence Thomas hearings that uh, you know put Anita Hill um, in this position of, of outside of blackness in a sense and um, you know really illustrated the ways in which uh, black women are often targeted and scapegoated in, in these situations. But, uh, but it was also opposition to the reactionary nature of Clarence Thomas in addition to the sexism and the sexual harassment. So, um, so, so that, was a, that was a campaign in 1991. We got 1,600 people, many of them in this room, Beverly, Beth, of course, and Kathy. Um, you know, to, to do ads in newspapers to declare a different way of viewing what was happening in those hearings, which wasn't um, you support Clarence Thomas if you support a black agenda, you support Anita Hill if you're concerned about gender, which was an artificial um, division. And we, we crafted a statement that, that pointed that out, Elsa Barkley Brown, um, Deborah King, and myself. And it was an organization that actually lasted for a number of years after that. Um, and the other one is, of course, the Black Radical Congress in 1998, which had a very strong um, black feminist caucus uh, that talked about um, black radical traditions, socialist traditions that were a part of the mix, feminist radical feminist traditions that were a part of the mix, revolutionary nationalist uh, traditions that were a part of the mix. And that formation, Jamala Rogers and Bill Fletcher, many people were still doing work, uh, Kathy, uh, you know, some of the people that we still work with today, people that we worked with in Ann Arbor, organizing for many years, um, you know, continue to be a part of these various projects that we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. But I also want to say something, you know, about electoral, and, and those, I should say also, the Black Radical Congress was a direct response to the 1995 Million Man March, mm -hmm. which not only, back to the question of, you know, intersectionality or whatever we call it, um, but the, the intimate, inextricable, connections between patriarchy, capitalism, mm -hmm. and heterosexism, right? Um, because the Million Man March was advocating not only that black men assume their rightful places as a head of families and organizations and institutions, but also was calling for a black capitalist uh, solution to black working class problems um, and, and, and poverty, and that's just not gonna work. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, capitalism is in a major crisis uh, other speakers talked about the Democrats and the Republicans are in crisis, but in some ways, the economic logic of capitalism is itself in crisis. Climate change is a great example of that. But what I find very interesting in the electoral arena now is the resurgence, and not surprisingly women of color at the center of that, resurgence of a left flank within the Democratic Party. I don't think the Democratic Party can contain that left surge, and I think it will be very, very interesting to see what other kind of formation becomes a political home for, but you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who are followers of the so-called squad, mm -hmm. and they're not monoliths, by the way. Right. They, 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 they're not in agreement on everything. We we're very disappointed that Ayanna Presley did not uh, uh, did not stand with the others uh, in supporting the restrictive uh, censoring. Um, anti-BDS uh, mm -hmm. legislation recently. Um, but but still, I think they represent um, a left voice that we have not heard in the Democratic Party um, in a while. And we are so used to saying to politicians, I mean, they lie to us so much and don't show up. Like when people actually do what communities have sent them there to do, which was part of my argument in that article, um, we almost don't know how to come to their defense. Mm -hmm. So one thing that another black feminist intervention recently was um, some of us, Tenji, Tenji Wei, who was just here, was a part of this who organized 100 black women in support of Ilhan Omar um, in Washington, D.C. And you know, three sitting members of Congress came, Angela Davis, 
uh, came, you know, it was it was an important statement of support uh, for her, mm -hmm. and it was predicated on the notion that you know she belongs to us, mm -hmm. right? And we don't often get to say that about politicians. Mm -hmm. So I think that's new. I, I think it's very fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for me, it doesn't mean now I've got faith in this corporate Democratic Party, uh, but what it means is that that is an arena for struggle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So I um. I know you don't want to get to ask the questions, but I do have a question for us to think about how we, in one of the earlier panels, we talked about digging deep. Mm -hmm. So the attack on the squad was so clearly uh, about gender, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's and race, and race right? But both, politics. right? Mm -hmm. And politics. But, <laughs> but I want to say, but it was about gender. Yeah. And I, I kept waiting for, I mean, I knew Barbara would have something to say about that, but where's the, where's the mass response mm -hmm. to the targeting of them as women, mm -hmm. right? I know it came in line with a lot of other targeting of black people right around that, but what, mm -hmm. I feel like we, we haven't yet, and we still can, but we haven't yet said this was a targeting of women mm -hmm. that has to be challenged as, as black feminists, we have to challenge that specific targeting of them. And I don't mean to say that's all it was, but it, it certainly was that, right? So that actually creates a question for me, for all of you all, is what's your take on the contempt a contemporary women's movement? Does it exist? Because mm -hmm. um, I think that is a part of your question, is where's the response? So is there a movement that is poised to respond to that? from the framework uh, specifically addressing gender. Do y'all think that exists? I, 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 I think the women's movement exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think BYP 100 mm -hmm. is women's movement. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, okay. So I, I, don't see the, I, I don't see the women's movement as one monolithic now mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Uh, a Black Women's Health Project, which mm -hmm. is morphed into, I can't remember the name now, it's, it's women's movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I see uh, the, the, the anti Nelly mm -hmm. uh, mobilization on Spelman's campus among that small group of, of, of ooh, excuse me, Afrikiti and Tony Bambera collective folk is women's movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I, 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 would, I would say that radical feminist movement is alive and well in, in, in different spaces. It just doesn't get much naming or publicity. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I, think, I think also, do we want to call it a women's movement or do we want to call it you know, uh, a feminist movement or a, a left, I would say, black left feminist movement? And I think, you know, I mean, because you know, I think um, this generation has also pushed the, the, the envelope around you know, making sure LGBTQ folks, including trans folks, are included, and um, all of that. So, so a, a feminist movement for me, the feminist movement part is so important because um, that speaks to a politic. Right. It's what you, what you believe, and it's not just who you are. So, it's, it's it's what you believe, and so I see that in BYP. I mean, what I was trying to say, perhaps inarticulately at the outset, is that there are all these movements where there there are black, what we would identify as black left. Uh, feminist mm -hmm. politics at play that often don't get named mm -hmm. as such. And the, the group I named in Puerto Rico, I'm so impressed with them, um, the, the Colectiva Feminista Construcción, it is, it's, it's a black feminist collective. Mm -hmm. And they are in the streets around a corrupt government. The governor's got to go, he's gone. Now that like, Juarez has got to go. Um, they're, they were on the webinar with Oscar Lopez Rivera, the former political prisoner, so they're linking intergenerationally. But feminism in their name unapologetically, right? Mm -hmm. To use your word. Um, so, so I think it's there. Uh, you know, we can talk about the Women's March and Me Too, and we can talk about the supermajority, which is a new formation um, that emerged. I think we have to name um, what, they, what, what is intersecting, mm -hmm. right? We have to name what we are abolishing because if, if Beth has taught us it's not just prisons. Right. Um, it is also a whole systemic infrastructure that as long as it's in place, we are not going to be free. Mm -hmm. And so we have to name those things. And to me, you name that in a politic. You don't name it in a descriptor. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I think that there are, um, 
I'm not saying anything different, just from a different perspective. All around the country, there are, in small local ways, campaign-based initiatives that are black, queer, feminist, left, abolition praxis. Mm -hmm. And what I think we haven't done is looked at them carefully enough to see what they look like, to realize that they're, in some ways, they can't be scaled up because they are so localized. I mean, there's similarities, but I think we make a mistake when we look for like the movement instead of the small spaces where people are doing radical work. Um, and, and I think we also have to understand that this is an aspirational identity. Maybe it's not an identity, but a project. Mm -hmm. Because if we only look at what has worked or what campaigns everyone knows about, then I think we'll miss some of what I think is the exciting kind of on the ground activism. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a new um, version of mainstream uh, white feminist problems <laughs> coming our way. I mean, I really do. I think that as we, and it's sort of um, obscured by the way that we have to pay attention to Trump mm -hmm. and the overt white supremacy, but I think there is a buildup on another side. Uh, it's part of why we're distracted from the small, grassroots, locally, aspirationally oriented uh, black feminist queer work on the ground. Mm -hmm. Could I just say right quick? Most m most folks don't even know that there was a robust black feminist queer history. Right. Going right. going back right. Right. going back yeah. to to SNCC. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. so so you know Kimberly uh, Springer wrote that book yeah. which talks about uh, black feminist work. We didn't we didn't know about Third World Women's Alliance mm -hmm. right. and Salsa right. Sisters. That so mm -hmm. so e even even our black feminist history is buried. Right. So, so I, and I'm going to imagine that when somebody's trying to, uh, you know, write about this uh, moment, they won't necessarily know about all of the black feminist right. uh, stuff that's going on um, in the U.S., not to mention Afro-Brazilian feminists right. who read um, black feminists here. So I would, I would say that we don't know our own black feminist history, which goes Actually, even goes back, as you know, uh, uh, to the 40s and 50s. But we don't even know the 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 the, the 60s and 70s part mm -hmm. of it. We we think that mm -hmm. that uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's statement about right. intersectional feminism was the beginning right. of the of the uh, Black feminist movement. So I I would like for us to, to to be in contact with that radical Black feminist history that goes way back and actually came out of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, Beverly's talking about Kimberly Springer's book, Living for the Revolution. And it, uh, I think the title is, uh, she includes a quote from Fran Bill yes. about it's like easier to die for the, than to live for the revolution. Yeah. Right. Uh, and like she even, Kimberly Springer has like a timeline of black feminist organizations in there. It's online, it's, it's a really important book, I think, along with At the Dark End of the Street you mentioned by um, Daniel McQuire. Anyway. And Words of Fire, which Beverly Words arrested, of Fire, is, Arrested and Justice, by like Beth, like there's so many books. And I would even say like videos, like visual yeah. things. Um, I, I'm thinking of uh, the documentary No um, on on Ray by Aisha Simmons. Like there's so many things that Black feminists have, like visual works and written works that Black feminists have produced to really talk about our history and vision. And if we don't know the history, like we got to teach each other that, right? It's like we are the bearers of of that history. We have a responsibility. Yeah. Now, as we're saying this, I'm just imagining what. You know, all of you. I don't know all of you. I know many of you. You know, are thinking, um, and I and I think sometimes we we shouldn't have to, but sometimes maybe we need to make the case. Of, like, why is this important? Yeah. You know, and for me, in many ways, or or even the question of you know Beth's important work on carceral feminism. Why is this important? So for you know the the, the larger, more general question, I think black left feminism offers us a way to interrogate hierarchy, oppression, and just on a very intimate and fundamental level, right? Uh, most people learn hierarchy uh, and oppression as children. 
they learn that it is natural for some people to make the decisions and others to, 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 to play a different role. And I know, you know, we have a line in, in, in the African American community, black women have never, you know, just played. No, we have not mimicked white women's uh, experience of, you know, femininity or anything else. But we have had and still have patriarchal institutions mm -hmm. that really inform our lives, the traditional black church being one of them. HBCUs. So, HBCUs, there's a whole list. Historical civil rights organizations. Families. Um, families, yeah. And, you know, families are complicated too because even if, the, you know, of the, the biological father is not home, there's still a notion of what a normative family is that we either resist, accept, or are influenced by. So I think uh, what feminism offers on a fundamental level is for to us to rethink and reimagine human relations. And if we don't do that, we will never talk about a truly transformative um, political project. So that's one thing. And the carcerality thing I think is so important now as we see the changing nature of the state. When we talk about the state, you know, there's the coercive arm of the state, the police and the military, which has gotten stronger and stronger. And then there's the services and resources uh, that's, and planning that states provide, which is which is shrunk. Right and been privatized, and under neoliberalism, really uh, caused enormous suffering uh, for our people. So the complicated um, roles of different arms of the state is very important when we talk about, um, you know, abolitionist feminism and what that means. It means to push back against what the state sees as its needs as this, at this point, and what people that we love and communities we come from need from the state at this point. So anyway, so it's so it's so it's. I don't want it to. Um, as we talk about the particulars, I also want to kind of go macro and say, you know, what's the aerial view of this and why is it important? And then, you know, like come back down to the ground on it. And, and to add to that, a concrete example, just before yeah. we go, go yeah. down, Shani, um, one of the best examples I think of why a black queer feminist abolitionist project makes our work better is the critical resistance insight statement. Absolutely. Critical resistance is one of the most important abolitionist organizations in the country, long history, right? Yes, yes? right? Yes. Critical yes. resistance, yes. yeah. Um, insight is, I think, one of the most important, primarily black feminists, but other feminists of color-led anti-violence organizations in the country. And at uh, 20 years ago, those two groups uh, came together really for the first time, I think, to talk about how you can do abolition work, abolition of police, abolition of prisons, abolition of carceral approaches to solving social problems in a way that takes seriously harm done to women and gender nonconforming people. So often you'll go places and those are two groups of people that are on the other side of the room close the prisons, abolish the police, don't arrest anyone on one side of the room, and on the other side of the room are people who say, but what? how are you gonna keep women safe? Women and queer people and children and some men safe. So the groups came together, spent a weekend, and came up with a statement and said, um, we will sign on to an abolition politic, often defined as a racial justice issue, and abolition people said, we will sign on to a gender liberation politic if you gender uh, rights advocates agree to not feed mass imprisonment in this country and demanding that the gender uh, violence advocates demanding that you figure out ways to keep women, children, and gender nonconforming people safe, right? And so a weekend was spent um, where a statement was written that became really a working document that now can move from community to community and the work is better because abolition groups can talk to gender liberation groups with something concrete in front of them. This is how you do this. These are the kind of accountability systems, this is the kind of analysis, this is the kind of organizing that has to happen. And, it t and that was led by a black feminist analysis of liberation from gender violence in a way that doesn't feed mass criminalization. So the work is better because we did that. And not just the work in black and brown communities, but I think all abolition work is better 
and all gender violence work, anti-gender violence work is better because black feminists came together to try to do this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to what you were sharing, Barbara, earlier about uh, abolition, um, abolitionist feminism, and you were talking about the things that we push against, and Beth, you, I think you just mentioned a lot of it, is that the responsibility of abolitionists is to, yes, tear these things down, as your daughter taught me, uh, it is to also build up the things that we want. Right. And so uh, I'm actually going to open it up to the audience, our participants, to ask questions. And uh, yep, we have one person in the back. Oh, that's just the word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Jessica. Um, and my question is, you know, you all um, each mentioned moments, but historically you are contending publicly either in debate or through organizing around black queer feminist politics. Um, and now there's this kind of new formation around ADOS, the uh, uh, American Descendants of Slaves. And I'm wondering if you have advice for those of us who are you know, organizing or what we thought were organizing similar in similar spaces, whether or not we should be publicly debating their ideas around reparations, their anti-immigrant and anti-feminist stances. And if you do believe that we should be publicly debating that, what you believe our responsibility is in that debate? Well, that's something I've been avoiding. I mean, I, maybe most, I hope most people here probably know about ADOS, um, American Descendants of Slavery, um, who have gotten a lot of airtime lately, I think, in certain circles. I'm not sure how large they are. But um, as the reparations debate has evolved, and you know, some folks that we have worked with in the past have started to kind of echo some of those. And basically, they argue that it is only mm -hmm. African Americans who need to be a part of the, of the reparations formula in this country. And, you know, who knows what the formula is going to be anyway? But uh, but it's a very um, narrow nativist agenda. Um, some folks, Kwesi uh, 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 Tabi uh, has. Um, talked about their connect, some, some connection to even more conservative uh, forces. Um, you know, I think we should debate the ideas. I don't think we should give them oxygen necessarily as, as, a, as a formation, um, because I'm not sure what the base really is. I think there are people that go off. And I do think those anti-immigrant ideas are in our communities. And this, people have talked about throughout, part of the work we have to do is not just against the people who we know are not acting in the best interest of uh, people of color, working class folks, etc. Uh, but, but in our own community, we have to engage in debates about what kind of world do we want, what kind of struggles are important, and who the we is, right? So, so, um, so I think we should debate those ideas. Um, the, the idea that you would have a nativist agenda for reparations in this country mm -hmm. when slavery was obviously a transatlantic institution. Many people landed in the Caribbean. Most of the people coming across landed in Brazil. Uh, and then some people made their way from the islands here, you know, either maroon um, voyages or uh, forced, uh, you know, another phase of the forced migration. So, um, so I think that's a very narrow view. I think those ideas need to be uh, tackled, and we, we can't be afraid of doing that in public spaces. I'm not sure that particular organization. A lot of people like, you know, I look at the tweets, and you go, you trace them back. It's like 35 followers. So I'm not sure who they're talking to or we're giving more, you know, light uh, on, on a formation that is um, antithetical to our values. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, thank you, by the way, for your presentation on the last panel. And there was something that you said actually about, this is paraphrasing because you said, it, there's, when do we figure out what to publicly debate mm -hmm. and with whom? And um, so part of what, and so these are questions, not an answer. Where do we have debates with um, other black people? Uh, and how public are they? Who's, who are we actually debating? Is it a small group of people? Or are we really able to find a place to have a debate that would ignite a lot of different people's uh, interests? Because even though it's a small group of people, a lot of people believe a position 
um, how much of it do we just sort of yield ourselves to the call out culture of like, I can't believe you said that, you know, versus a real serious, deep debate about the origin of what ideas are and therefore what un unintended consequences might be about particular political formulations. In other words, I think the question of when we have, when do we have a public debate where we have to challenge each other when we're trying to mobilize around some larger, in some larger movement spaces to try to create change is an unanswered question. And for me, when I think about black, as a black feminist, when do we challenge, like the students did, right, mm -hmm. at Spelman, when do we say you can't have that sign up there? When a lot of people think you shouldn't have that sign up there anyway, but you can't have that sign up there without women's names on it. And when does the whole sign have to come down versus an internal debate in a classroom or in a community of people at Spelman about it, right? So to me, the question about when we start to call people out who's um, ideas and agendas are causing harm, and when do we try to figure out a different way to have a discussion without, I don't know, exposing uh, that dirty laundry, right? That so many, I mean, that's certainly what one of the questions around violence mm -hmm. in black communities of, around that call out and confrontation. I'll just add very quickly to that, I think we made a number of, we, we had a lot of missed opportunities in the past mm -hmm. like five, six years and not like openly mm -hmm. debating ideas with right. some right. bad actors, just yeah. with right. terrible ideas right. mm -hmm. that don't actually help and that are regressive, false solutions. And so I appreciate your question because to me it's, a, it's something that I've actively been avoiding and needed to be agitated around because we do need to, we do need to argue, debate and be, take firm positions on the ideas and make really compelling arguments to our folks. But I don't know if it's story-based, actually I do. It, it involves story for sure, but we have to do it or other folks will do it for us. Mm -hmm. so, Mary? Uh, this is a really good question. I'm curious, um, is black feminism an ideology? I never, I don't hear it talked about <laughs> as such, as an ideology. And I'm curious, is that intentional or not? But I, I always hear it like um, as a politic, obviously a politic that should be practiced, all the things. But curious if that's um, if it's yeah out of out of scope or whatever to say it's an ideology. And if so, why not? Why or why not? I, I would say it's definitely an ideology in the theory. A, a, to me, a simple one. It is the ideology that says we want all oppressions eradicated. Yeah, sexism, heterosexism. It is. It is an illogical and theoretical position. I, 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 I think that that question comes up because, and not necessarily from you, because we don't imagine that black women create mm -hmm. theory, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, 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 or I mean, we, would, we would never ask that about Marxism, mm -hmm. right. okay, or socialism, mm -hmm. or any of those isms. We would never say, is that an ideology? Mm -hmm. Right. But it is, mm -hmm. and it's a theory, and it's powerful, mm -hmm. and it helps uh, us to navigate not just black communities, but the way in which we think about the world. I think it's, I think radical, queer, abolitionist <laughs> feminism is one of the most radical and useful ideologies and theories that we can use to get ourselves out of this mess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ashley. Yeah. I, I think it's. I do think it's an ideal and an ideology. Now that is a big box. So you mentioned, or Beverly mentioned Marxism, which is another um, ideology that has influenced my thinking over the years. Um, but it is hugely contested, and I think that has to be added, right? So there is not a thing where you can say this is, this is feminism, and it explains. This is feminism, and it calls for. It is contested ideas, right? And there is a core, as Beverly said, um, but 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 we fight. I mean, there are people who claim feminism who I disagree with. Mm -hmm. There's also people who claim socialism that I disagree with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so so I think all ideologies are contested. I'm not sure. I mean, we, we could talk about what I, I certainly would not say intersectionality as it's often defined is necessarily a theory. I would say it is a, a, a intellectual approach. But I do think, uh, you know, sort of black feminism is category. It has a body of work. It has debates. It has a practice, right? It has some tenets that people agree on, and many 
that, uh, that they debate, but it's an excellent question. Now, I'll just do this to just be a little, you know, grumpy. Uh, which is to say, one thing I think we leave out sometimes in talking about my version of black feminism is capitalism. Because for me, like going back to Combehi, um, you know, uh, it, 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 I don't think we can abolish, I don't think there's a world without prisons and cops that is a world with capitalism. So, but I, but I think that's a challenge and it's a real challenge for me too because I saw the failure of 20, 20th century socialist experiments. So I say that with enormous humility, broke my heart. But, um, but, but so we have to entertain like what does it mean to reimagine um, the socialist ideals uh, that, 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 that animated the 20th century? What does it mean to understand that capitalism is destroying itself? Um, and that we really do think, need to think, as Paul Mason says, a post-capitalist society. Um, but it can't be one that, re, you know, that in some ways re-inscribes patriarchy, homophobia, um, you know, all, all of the other uh, white supremacy, all the other components. And so, you know, that's a big question. I think each each piece of it have to be um, interrogated in this historical context. But, I, but Yes, I think we're all saying to your question. And one of the things I think we have to say is, you know, there's a huge debate among old ass feminists, black feminists like us. Wait, what? what? <laughs> and, 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 no, there's a particular category of young feminists, young black feminists who, who, who are not anti-capitalist. I know this. And who say, <laughs> and who old are old too. And, 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 and say that the radical black feminism that we're, that, that we're Describe as prescriptive oh, and and right. okay, so I'm just saying. Was I on mic? No. Yeah, so we just no, we, and and I won't you know and and certain uh, <laughs> folk who have an anti-capitalist black feminist perspective have been deep have been really uh, critiqued very much. Mm -hmm. And those with an anti-imperialist yes, perspective. Yes, and, and with an anti-imperialist black, right, black feminist who stand yes. in solidarity so, with Palestine. Right, so that's why I like your black left feminist yeah. category. Yeah, because you brought up like black queer feminist, um, feminism and black queer uh, feminist abolitionism. I'm going to just say it as somebody who's written about, about black queer feminism. I don't think it's a, like a fully fleshed out, embodied no. ideology yet. It needs to be way more contested. It needs to be way more talked about, written about, way more work that has to be done. It's a, I, it's a challenge to folks for me who are like, I don't get this thing, I disagree, or I think it should be different. It should be just as contested as black feminism has been in order for it to, for me to like really have, um, for lack of better words, legs. Yeah. Right. Can I, can I interact with you on that for just sure. a second? Which is to say, you know, I mean, it, I mean, as both somebody that tries to take takes theory seriously and as a historian, you know, some of these mammoth categories of theory have been wrong about fundamental things and we still take them seriously. So, I mean, in some ways, all ideology is contested and aspirational, right? We never have all the answers. So, you know, Marx had a theory about where, you know, proletarian revolution would happen, didn't happen there. That was a big, you know, miscalculation, right? But we still take Marxism yeah. seriously, right. yeah. despite its failures. Um, and, I, and I think uh, black queer feminism is a provocation for us to think about, wrestle with, mm -hmm. and it offers some understandings and it offers an invitation to wrestle with Absolutely. others. Yeah. Right. And it's why well, I think the aspirational <laughs> dimension of it is really important, not as an excuse to like not do it, mm -hmm. but more to say we are in, we, we are still in, in process mm -hmm. yeah. around that. And I so appreciated when I understood BYP 100's claim mm -hmm. to be a black queer feminist organization. I understood it not as we are a black queer feminist organization, but we strive to be a black queer feminist organization, which means we will engage in a kind of self-critique mm -hmm. around issues of gender violence, mm -hmm. commitment to um, sort of de facto capitalism, I'm not sure what I even mean by that, but you know, not, not interrogating questions about how capitalism might be part of what we, what we perform or what we do, or at least what we, not, what we don't critique, right? Mm -hmm. So the aspirational part, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. And again, I think we're all going to argue for, for what 
what we want in that long label of, but I think, I think abolition does give us the aspirational dimension in ways that other parts of that subtitle don't. Mm. Because building a community committed to abolition means, as you said, it's not just abolishing police or closing all prisons or uh, making sure that we don't, that we, you know, we close the jail or elect certain people into political office but that we turn around and look at communities and make sure there's health care and mental health care and schools that really teach people and green spaces and all the other things that we want the world to look like. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, an important part of what a feminist abolition brings to even people who have a narrow de definition of abolition, which is mm -hmm. shut it down, not build it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I think that builds on what Barbara was saying, and this um, this last round of conversation also adds to trying to add, um, be much more specific about um, Black feminists kind of moving forward, Black feminism moving forward. And I'm thinking about so, in all of a sudden, data shows that Black women can move elections. All of a sudden. Um, and so now there's a lot of mainstream attention, more than I've ever seen, around black women's voices in the electoral arena. And I think it could catapult, it already has catapulted some folks into office, mm -hmm. and could catapult a black woman into the White House, let's say. Good. A particular black woman. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about a particular one, yes, and, I, yes. and I wonder what a moment like that looks like for black feminists, black queer feminists, um, because abolitionists, right? What is, what is, and I wonder what that, right? I wonder what that moment looks like because it is so easily captured mm -hmm. and declared done, mm -hmm. right? Over. I will go first. I certainly could. But. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think you know we, and I can say this truth because I know their work and they've helped to hone my thinking. Um, that all of us reject a kind of essentialist notion of of, of black womanhood and black and 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 and. and, and race and gender. Mm -hmm. And so to, to, you know, for those who would say, well, it would be a great victory for black, black feminism mm -hmm. that we have a black woman in the White House. I mean, we learned, I mean, we learned an important lesson. This generation learned an important mm -hmm. lesson with Barack Obama, which was the mm -hmm. limits of, of representational politics, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, know, you know the answer to the question you asked, I know. Um, but I do think that is, that, that's work within our community. Well, the fact that you could have, you know, a, um, a black woman who has spent a good part of her career locking up black people right. as a claiming victory for a black feminist anti-carceral, um, you know, agenda is 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 a contradiction, you know. And but but what you, but your part of the question is how do you how do you struggle with people around that? Well, and and to to use your example that you know when I talk to folks in my family mm -hmm. about Barack Obama particularly now in a moment of Trump, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear a critique because they'll bring us our president back, mm -hmm. right? And so we could very well be in that moment too, like where it becomes like, well, what do you want? What are you asking for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think, go ahead. I think people are, not to what you said earlier, Barbara, I think a lot of us are asking different questions in this moment. In both post Obama, he's still there though. He's still here. He up the street, like you know, it's around right here. So he's right here. And, uh, and you know, in a, in a Trump era, the you know, like they're still present in our thinking and in our lives in so many ways. And at the same time, there was just an article the other day in the Guardian about a black woman saying why she can't vote for simply just vote for uh, Harris because she's a black woman. And those conversations, I feel like they're starting earlier. Mm -hmm and becoming a lot more um, sharp, mm -hmm. or they're becoming sharper, 
And that doesn't mean that, yeah, and we also we can look at the polling numbers. There's several things, indicators that we can look to, I think, in this moment that don't just say all black women are like lining up, mm -hmm. like in that way. That doesn't mean that some black women are lined up. And I think we should engage and have to engage those black women. And not from a place, as Adrian said earlier, of like, there's something wrong with you or there's something wrong with your perspective because that's just gonna shut them down. But really like asking different questions and like I can, count on one finger how many candidates have approached many black women activists and leaders in this uh, cycle so far. And it ain't who you may expect it to be. And so I, I really want us to lean into the opportunities that are there and not shut our people out who are with Biden, who are with Harris, who are with Sanders, who are with Warren, Julian Castro, any of those people and like really engage our folks from a place of like, of respect mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, dignity. If we're, if we're going to be serious about not electing a, a pro carceral candidate, because it, it can happen if we don't. Yeah, yeah we would have both people on a ticket, yeah. mm -hmm. fairly entrenched, not fairly, completely entrenched in a carceral response to violence. Mm -hmm. be, you know, because we could have a critique of Biden's, you know, claim about his uh, support for the Violence Against Women Act and creation of the Office of Violence Against Women, all of which is a carceral response to gender-motivated violence. And so between, I mean, imagine that ticket, the right. two of them. And I do want to take, you know, I'm going to sit next to Mary, who says, you know, how do we say to people, you've got to take a long view, you've got to be really critical of the details of what it meant to build up a prison nation through arresting people when their children were, couldn't get to school. Mm -hmm under new truancy laws, right? When we say, so how do we critique her for that? Mm -hmm. And also say, but we can't have, we, can't, we won't survive mm -hmm. if Trump wins. Mm -hmm. And so how, how, you know, what's the, you know, Mary's gonna figure that out for us by the next time we get to Martha's Vineyard. But it really is, it really is those questions. Cause that's like a detail that most people don't even know. Um, and it's hard to explain to people why that is so, that takes life away. Not in the same way or the same scale that Trump does, but it also ruins people's lives. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Could, could, could I also say that that person was, <laughs> did not want uh, trans people in prison to, 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 to have uh, resources for their surgery. Right. And I would like, it to be a situation when I say that to my uh, black comrades, they think that's terrible. Rather than to say to me, "Who cares?" Right. So, so, so we have to add. We we have Absolutely. to add that to it. Absolutely, the, the, you know. <laughs> and for folks who are like like to flesh stuff out, who don't know what Beverly's talking about, uh, gender affirming surgery and healthcare that people just need mm -hmm. and relevant and like safe and effective healthcare and the healthcare that's with dignity for trans folks, gender nonconforming folks. Imagine if we lived in that world, right? Where folks who have like been pushed all the way aside have full access to health care. Mm -hmm. This is the same self comedy he said. Mm -hmm. That would that that's that, that's health care for me too. That's not just gonna be like that group of folk. And so Matt, like if that is the kind of politic we were moving in, what would be possible? And so the the way we're gonna we, I would like for us to close it is um, I like to ask these five questions. Who am No, 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 no. Okay, let me, not right now. <laughs> not right now. But these are five questions that I think we can all take with us in our work after this to interrogate. And the last question is the one I want you all to touch on. The first is, who am I? The second is Ella Baker's question, who are your people? The third is, what do we want? The fourth is, what are we building? And the fifth, which is the one that I want you all to remark on, is, are we ready to win? And, we're, and if your answer to that question is no, what do we need to do in order to get ready? And so each person, y'all got about, you know, two minutes. And y'all between us and the bar. Right. <laughs> so, yes. Are we ready? Are we ready to win? Yes. Do you want to go first? I can, I guess. I have to say no. Um, but I think we can get ready. Um, I, I, I think we have to, again, I think take very, very seriously um, the political moment we're in. I think Trump winning again in 2020 is, is going to be 
I think he's prepared to do things we haven't seen yet and maybe not even imagined. And there's a lot of, it can happen here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always, the it I'm talking about is, 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 is what we might refer to as some form of fascism. Mm -hmm. now, he's not gonna become Hitler, he's not gonna become Mussolini, he's not gonna become Franco. Uh, they weren't each other, but some form of extremely repressive, violent uh, uh, regime could be in our immediate future, and I don't say that with hyperbole. So, I don't, I don't really, I'm in a lot of spaces where we're talking about these ideas. I don't think we move with the urgency uh, that reflects that that is true, right? So I think we need to be much more rigorous. I think we need to be a hell of a lot more disciplined. I think we need to think locally and think big. I think we need to learn from what has happened in other places and is happening in other places in the world, from you know, Puerto Rico to Brazil. Um, so, so I don't think we're ready to win. Uh, but I think we need to get ready um, in a very, very serious way. And, and I am hopeful of the amazing young organizers that I have the privilege to work with, that, that people are fighting hard to get there. So before Barbara talked, I was like, of course we are ready. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be yes. us, right? Yeah, we're ready. No. Um, so it's yes and no now. Um, I mean, I feel, I feel very moved by this discussion these last few days. I feel moved by what I'm seeing people try to do, not always succeed, but try to do. I feel like I'm ready. I feel like there are lots of people who are you know, ready, say I'm ready. And I think we're almost more ready in our hearts than we are in our strategy. Mm -hmm. So that's encouraging to me. So it's yes and no. I, I, was, I would say that I came into this space kind of down mm -hmm. about the uh, horrendous. I mean, I, I hardly look at TV anymore. It is so mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. But I'm leaving this space a very hopeful and, 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 and optimistic. And, and I want to remember what Kathy said about uh, young people, uh, I think, are going to help us move from no to yes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't come in here uh, thinking that. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm I'm feeling very good about uh, where we are, mm -hmm. and 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 I want to just thank all of the audience, the organizers, the foundation for helping us to get to this space. And we have already um, we have, we'll already have part two. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk about it? Yes, we <laughs> want to uh, convene in the spring some uh, mixture of. We want to give you the, uh, the spring, possibly in Atlanta, um, a mixture of some young folk and some elders to continue to do some transference of memory, talk about lessons, but potentially debate, ask questions, but to continue to be in this uh, dialogue today. Yeah. Thank you. about part two. Um, this has been, I, this is like I'm going to make it very quick, I promise Kathy. Um, but I, I've been thinking about Toni Morrison mm -hmm. and how much she loved, um, she's, I've been listening to her interviews mm -hmm. and she talked about how she loves sound, the sound of words, and she loved questions. And I think that this gathering has been a perfect memorial for mm -hmm. her and mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. in, in the euphony of questions, mm -hmm. the beautiful euphony of questions that have been brought to bear over the last day and a half. So again, thank you. Um, we're gonna go outside and try to take a quick picture. Wait a minute. So on the way, <laughs> everyone pick up a drink. Pick up a drink. <laughs> <laughs> go outside. Go outside.
for a quick picture. They're going to break down the room, and we'll have some time for networking and recepting and some really great food. And you filled me all with your wonderful words and questions. Thank you.